BBOR, Black Box, Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia, Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we truly begin. The first is that, of course, I am the host of the Zodiac Killer News Report, which is more commonly known as Zodiac Monday. It comes out every Monday here on Black Box Online Radio. And also do a segment every Wednesday about Jack the Ripper, called Ripper Wednesday. And if you're curious about these true crime cases, I invite you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And also, I am the author of the book Killer on a White Horse, as stated in the introduction. And there is a sequel story to that one in my second book, Down the Dark Lane, Three Thrillers from the Motel. And I'm going to be taking the sequel story and releasing a new version of Killer on a White Horse that's going to contain the final story. And at some point in the near future, I'm hoping that I will also release an audio version of Down the Dark Lane that will be put out on YouTube for free. So lots of things to pay attention to. And if you want to follow along with all of these things, of course, you can subscribe to the channel. But if you want to support these efforts, you can go through some of the links in the description box, including the one for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show. And anyone who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. Now, as far as today's topic goes, earlier this year, I did an episode on the Son of Sam for the Anything Goes Friday segment. It was called Son of Sam Psychological Profile because I was looking at the serial killer David Berkowitz, who was also known as the 44 caliber killer in addition to being the Son of Sam, and I wanted to make certain comments in regards to what David Berkowitz was doing and thinking at the time of the murders that took place in the late 1970s. The Son of Sam was a killer that terrorized the New York area in that time frame. There was actually a very small amount of time that was devoted to the Son of Sam shootings, but I knew that there was a follow-up episode that had to have be, been done at some point, and this one, as you can see from the title, is going to be on the death of John Carr. About two years ago, they released a documentary called Sons of Sam, where I was looking at two people, the Carr brothers, who actually had a father named Sam who knew David Berkowitz, and they're trying to draw some type of connection. Were they involved with the murders? Or perhaps, perhaps, were they also involved with a larger nationwide movement that was responsible for murders and crimes all across the country? And a very large proponent of that theory was Maury Terry, and he is the architect of certain aspects of it. But it's definitely a theory that has evolved into its own dimensions, and it goes beyond Maury Terry and his book, The Ultimate Evil. But who was John Carr, and why should he have a direct connection to the Son of Sam? Now, I'm going to go over to a website that I have never uh, used before on the channel, and it's from it's called popsugar.com, and they have an, an article called Who Was John Carr and What Happened to Him? And the reason why this episode is titled The Death of John Carr is because there are two accounts of his death. One is that he committed suicide, and one that he was murdered. And, I mean, if you also want to hear a, a direct response to the documentary Sons of Sam, I have one on this channel. But I wanted to read this article from Pop Sugar because there were parts that I thought were informative, and there were also parts that I thought 
or I disagreed with. The son of Sam carried a 40 bore caliber gun and killed six and injured seven between 1976 and 1977 in New York City. Investigative journalist Maury Terry didn't buy the story. It didn't seem feasible to him that David Berkowitz acted alone. One of the key suspects for Maury Terry was a man named John Carr, who died from a gunshot wound in 1978. Officials initially considered his death a suicide, but Maury Terry believed there was more to the story than the detectives had ever investigated. Okay, though, there, as I said, there were parts that I thought were informative, and there were parts that I didn't like. Okay, so just Maury Terry says that one journalist. How about providing some substantiating points as to why Maury Terry would think that John Smith says there's something suspicious about this. I mean, let's get to the specifics. So, who was Sam Carr? Who was John Carr? Two questions put together. We have to talk about Sam Carr first. The media pushed the sensational story that a dog belonging to David Berkowitz's neighbor Sam had commanded him to commit the murders. While Berkowitz confessed, Terry didn't believe that he acted alone, even though the New York PD wanted to close the case. Now, there was this dog named Harvey, and the story is that there was this demon inside the dog Harvey named Sam, and that's the demon that's giving the orders to David Berkowitz to commit the murders. This is something that Berkowitz adamantly denies now, and when you watch interviews with David Berkowitz, as I did before the um, Anything Goes Friday episode that came out in the spring, he doesn't even want to talk about it. He says that it's made up. He just views it as a distraction. And I don't think that it's true. I mean, on the Serial Killer podcast, which is hosted by Thomas Viborg Thune, one point that he wanted to make very clear was Berkowitz, by his own admission, never said that he actually heard the voice of the dog or the voice of the demon inside the dog. And my honest take on the subject is, I don't think any of that ever happened, even though David Berkowitz might have had some type of mental health issues, which I tried to explore in the uh, Son of Sam episode that I did. I don't think that he was hearing any auditory hallucinations from Harvey the dog or the demon Sam. While David Berkowitz confessed, Maury Terry didn't believe that he acted alone, even though the, the NYPD wanted to close the case. First, the timing wasn't quite right. During one of the shootings, Berkowitz was five blocks away from the crime scene, and it didn't seem possible for him to be there just two minutes before the shooting unfolded. Maury Terry also noted that Berkowitz didn't match several eyewitness accounts of the shooter, who they described as tall and blonde, but the person did match an individual named John Carr. All right, now, eyewitness descriptions are horribly unreliable. And, I mean, we get this in the Zodiac case all the time. Well, he was five feet, eight inches tall. No, he was six feet tall. I mean, people miss this stuff all the time, not to mention hair color at night. It's very, very difficult. How was John Carr connected to David Berkowitz? The son of Sam takes a closer look at how John Carr was the literal son of Sam and had connections with Berkowitz. Since Maury Terry lived near Berkowitz, he decided to look into John and found that he actually had a homeroom in school with him. There were many stories about Sam being abusive, and John and his brother Michael grew up in an abusive household. Observing the ominous Son of Sam letters that were sent to the authorities during the murders, Maury Terry noted references to the abuse. Terry decided to probe into the case further, so he found a local teen and guided him on a path stretching less than a mile but behind the car and Berkowitz residences on the old Croton Aqueduct. His findings were horrifying. Along the trail, they, there were dead dogs in an old building with blood everywhere that was called the Devil's Cave and was a, reportedly a meeting place for a cult called the children. Now here's the part where we have to challenge them. And this is why I said this article has good stuff and bad stuff. This hiding spot was reportedly the meeting place of the cult called the children. Reportedly. Yet they're saying they've re they're reporting on it, but they're not citing a source as to how they obtained this information. And yes, of course, of course, you can just read Maury Terry's book and listen to him, and you can also watch his interview with David Berkowitz. I would propose that it is the responsibility of a website like this, popsugar.com, greatest website ever made, perhaps, sorry for the sarcasm, that they should cite the source as to how they've obtained this information without just simply relying on Maury Terry, because if they're going to post an objective article, 
why not look at the pros and the cons, or why not try to actually get the truth as opposed to just simply accepting someone's word? Yeah, you know, I mean, somebody said that there was a cult there. Well, how did you get that information? Right after Berkowitz's arrest in 1977, John Carr went missing. In 1978, a deputy officer heard about someone trespassing at a housing unit on the Mino Air Force Base. When he looked into the situation, he heard a gunshot fire off and found John dead. Following John's death, investigators learned that there were people who had discovered him scribbling the Son of Sam symbol on old telephone books, and they said that he was a local cult leader. This is why I wanted to talk about John Carr as um, someone who is somewhat of an individual in this, as opposed to just focusing only on David Berkowitz. And if you were to try and read about John Carr, the articles that have been written about him are very frequently just zoning in on the documentary Sons of Sam, which came out two years ago. A lot of articles have been written about John Carr in 2021, but I wanted to find some older things, such as the news clipping that came after he passed away. And it was actually shared by a website called The Cinemaholic, but it says, Funeral services held for Sam Carr's son. And I'm just going to read off this. It's kind of like an obituary. Funeral services were held for Sam Carr's son in Yonkers today. John C. Carr, a 31-year-old former city resident, Carr's father, Sam Carr of Yonkers, a retired city public's work employee who operates an answering service here, figured prominently in the events before and after the arrest of David Berkowitz, a suspect in the Son of Sam slayings. Berkowitz lived near the Carrs who accused him of threatening and harassing them. According to the authorities in Ward County, John Carr apparently shot himself at a friend's house at Mino Air Force Base, where he was staying while attending Mino State College. The case is under investigation. Carr is survived by a daughter, his parents, a brother named Michael, and a sister named Wheat. That's one. There's a more in-depth article that was shared in the Bismarck Tribune, and this one came out on October 19th of 1979. Big thank you to all these websites who um, archive and share old newspaper articles. New Son of Sam probe officially open in North Dakota. That is indeed the headline. An investigation into whether a man helped David Berkowitz commit the Son of Sam murders has officially spread to two states. It was learned Thursday. Berkowitz pleaded guilty to six counts of first-degree murder and said that he was the Son of Sam who shot six young persons in a long terror spree that ended with his arrest in 1977. When caught, he told the police that the killings were in obedience to demonic orders that he received through his neighbor in New in Yonkers, Sam Carr and Carr's dog. Well, that is really um really a distortion of things because I mean, as I understand it, the famous story is that Berkowitz is getting them from Sam the demon that lives in the dog, not directly from Sam Carr. And that was the whole point of the Sons of Sam documentary, meaning that is this name Sam talking actually about Sam Carr, and he has two sons named John and Michael, and they are the Sons of Sam. Like, when someone's saying, I am the Son of Sam, why would Berkowitz say that? I mean, it could have also been just some type of dumb thing that Berkowitz created, because if you ever watch interviews with David Berkowitz, he's kind of a jerk, let alone a convicted murderer. Police said last week that the mystery, the mysterious February 16, 1978, death of Sam Carr's son, John Carr, age 31, in Mino, North Dakota, was being investigated as a possible murder and connected to the Son of Sam killings. This article was written in 1979, mind you. Sources in New York Thursday said that the Queens District Attorney, John J. Santucci, also ordered the case reopened. Santucci's office refused to comment, but sources close to the case said that the district attorney had directed his homicide bureau to take a look at one, at the new evidence. The sources, and asked not to be quoted by name, Berkowitz, who insisted that he acted alone when arrested on August 10th of 1977, is serving 315 years at Attica Prison. John's car death at Mino Air Force Base was tentatively listed as a suicide after the initial investigation, but authorities never closed the case. Last week, it was reported that while questioning John Carr's friends, his relationship with Berkowitz and his apparent thorough knowledge of the Son of Sam killing surfaced. We have evidence that they knew each other, said Lieutenant Terry Gardner of the Sheriff's Office in Ward County, North Dakota. In an interview with the Associated Press last week, they said that they appeared to be associates and noted that they also, that John Carr also resembled at least one of the composite drawings that were circulated during the hunt for the Son of Sam. But what happened to John Carr? Was he a troubled person who committed suicide in North Dakota? 
or was he the leader of this mysterious cult that no one ever seems to be able to truly identify? And was he also one of the shooters in the Son of Sam murder spree? Now, there's another motivation for talking about this story, and that is that on last week's Zodiac Monday, I was reading off comments from you guys who have responded to a documentary called The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, and one of them, one of you guys who had responded was Manny Grossman, and he is someone who has done a very in-depth discussion on the Son of Sam on his channel. He spent, as he said, about two years exploring the mystery and trying to find out is there actually a mystery or was just David Berkowitz acting alone and lying to everyone, or is it something to the contrary where John Carr is actually this type of cult leader and is connected to this underground movement, firstly using the children and then expanding into something larger, the process church perhaps, and that multiple crimes throughout America, multiple high-profile crimes, maybe the Manson family, for example, could have interlocking connections to a nationwide movement. Well, which is which one is it? Which is the truth? Well, I would like to first read a comment that came from Manny Grossman that was done on the... Uh, on the episode that I did about David Berkowitz in the spring, and he says, I've spent two years proving that David Berkowitz acted alone, and my biggest sources of proof are David's own words. Not only does he go into great detail about each shooting in his letters to David Abramson, but he clearly explains why some of the shootings look like why some of the shootings look like Carl's I think he means why some of the shootings like Carl's were wilder than others, talking about the de the shooting of Carl De Niro. Yes, Carl De Niro survived. I almost said the death. No, Carl De Niro was shot in the back of the head, and then he went on to actually write a book called Why I Wasn't Shot by David Berkowitz. That's the subtitle. Quite simply, in Carl De Niro's shooting, he was using one hand. Very simple explanation. But perhaps the biggest piece of evidence, which speaks to your gut instinct, Ned, that you think that David Berkowitz was trolling Maury Terry, was a letter that I have in my possession, which I've shown on my show. It is from Berkowitz to his friend D. Chanel, who, and it says that Maury Terry is a pest. He also calls Maury Terry a stupid, non-Christian fool and a terrible investigator, so dumb that he would freeze to death in North Dakota. All of this info has been out there for all of us to see for 45 years, but Maury Terry fans, a cult in their own right, simply prefer to keep their heads in the sand. Once again, a really good, fair video. Thank you for making it. Hey, you know, Manny, I mean, I always appreciate that. And there has been a lot of pushback against Manny Grossman because he challenges this stuff in a very skeptical way. And a lot of people do not want to hear that. And then there are also people who just think that maybe it's not being open-minded enough. One of them would be Jeff, who responded by saying, this Manny Grossman guy says that in the comments that it's not possible for there to have been more than one killer in the Son of Sam case. He cannot fathom all things that are possible. Probability can be debated. Possibility, only if you were there and for all of the shootings. Manny is incapable of reasoning. And his response was, Manny Grossman responded by saying, No, I'm simply asking for you to provide me with actual examples. But instead, you're debating the differences in the meaning of possible and probable. Anything is possible, but I deal in a world of forensic facts. And that would suggest that David Berkowitz is the only shooter. Again, I will be glad to debate you when you provide your sources of information and research into the subject. And that ties in a lot to what I said about the Pop Sugar article about how I know that they're getting this information from Maury Terry and the Sons of Sam documentary, which was based on Maury Terry's explorations into David Berkowitz. But it's also just relying a lot on the reader to connect the dots. And I pointed out multiple examples already to this point where they're just saying, well, it's reported that this happened, or, well, I mean, this a source says this, but they don't state where these sources are, who is reporting on this. And they're just expecting someone to kind of connect the dots on their own, that there is this type of nationwide cult that is responsible for homicides all across the country. And then what, what did John Carr move to North Dakota and become a cult leader over there? And then he was murdered because of some type of malicious action. Now, if you want to ask my honest take on the subject, I have to play the skeptical card because with skepticism, you're not saying that something is impossible to speak to that comment. You're saying, I will accept it once I have the proof. 
and as of now, I don't see anything to the contrary of the narrative that John Carr committed suicide, and I would rule that his death should be listed as a suicide. And to the credit of Manny Grossman, both him and I actually do explore conspiracy theories, and we both even believe and understand conspiracy theories, and it's actually different ones that we think that to be true, but let's look at a comment that Manny left a couple days ago on the Zodiac Killer News Report, where he says, Great video, Ned. I've said it a million times on my channel that it never seems to penetrate. Let's talk all day about 9-11, OKC, and COVID. O OKC referring to Oklahoma City and 9-11 were huge in shaping my understanding of the world today, and I still know that they were inside jobs. That's a quote from Manny Grossman. But when it comes to true crime conspiracy theories, they often fall flat. I'm just thankful that I was able to wake myself up to the fact, and in doing so, I brought thousands of people along with me. And um, I'm going to stop right there, because the comment does go on. But I want to respond to this directly. Now, there are other conspiracy theories that I followed, that I think are true. Some people might just think they're just wild ramblings. Maybe Operation Northwoods would be a good example of that, something that turns out that it's based on fact. But in the true crime world, the conspiracy theories often fall flat when they are outrageous. Now, I've said in some early episodes of Black Box Online Radio, conspiracy theories in the true crime world tend to operate like maybe law enforcement committed critical errors in their discussions and in their investigations and in their presentations to the general public and their press conferences. And then they want to hide the truth. They want to cover up their mistakes. And that's the definition of a conspiracy that I use on this channel. Two or more people hiding the truth, usually for a malicious reason. And we'll find that there, there are those types of um, instances all the time. And sometimes we'll even find examples, let's say in the Long Island serial killer case, that the, the law enforcement was hiding the truth from the general public. They had way more information than we, than we knew about, but they didn't want to reveal that to the general public because they were zoning in on their suspect. And another example of this is the D.C. sniper case, where you had law enforcement putting out all of these reports that the D.C. snipers were two guys that were driving around in a white van with a roof rack, and that they were shooting people from that vehicle. But in reality... That was a pure disinfo campaign that was launched by law enforcement via the media. Really, the suspects were driving a blue caprice. And then that's why the name of the movie Blue Caprice with Isaiah Washington was made about the D.C. snipers. I have one episode about the D.C. sniper story if you'd like to listen to that. It's, um, it heavily focuses in on the Monster podcast, the Atlanta Monster podcast, as well as responding to a film that was made called Just That D.C. Sniper. I'd love to do a direct response to Blue Caprice one day. But those are examples of people hiding the truth, not for a malicious reason. Now, people like hiding the truth for a malicious reason in law enforcement would be they accidentally destroy the evidence, and they just don't want to comment on that. Do you understand how boring that is? But those are very frequently the true crime conspiracy theories that often turn out to be true. Now, this is where I would turn it over to you guys. Do you believe that the death of John Carr had a larger role in the Son of Sam case? Do you believe that John Carr had a larger role in the shootings? Now, maybe he matches some of the witness descriptions. Maybe Berkowitz couldn't have walked five blocks as fast as they said he could have. There are some pieces of evidence that I do have to give credit for to all of these sources. Do you think that there that the Carr brothers played a larger role? Or were they simply just two guys who knew David Berkowitz and he had a certain reason to target them? I mean, what do you think is more likely? And my overall assessment of David Berkowitz is that he became a serial killer because he was a very bored and lonely, frustrated male, I should say sexually frustrated male, so he used these types of murders as a way to escape from his mundane existence and reality. And this happens very, very frequently with serial killers, and I do think that it was a sexually motivated set of homicides that were not, um, that were not involving physical contact with the victims, but he was getting off on the crimes in some type of arousing way, in his own mind. Again, we're not talking about physical contact. And then 
he was more or less a loser in life who, instead of him choosing to improve his life, he wanted to destroy the lives of other people. Now, what do you think about all of that? You can put your ideas in the comment section down below. If you want to challenge me on any of this stuff about how I said that I think John Carr's death was a suicide, as of now I state that David Berkowitz act alone and I think that he lied to Maury Terry in his famous interview with him, please challenge me. Share some things. I would love to read your comments, and maybe they will be worked into a future episode of Black Box Online Radio. I also thank Manny Grossman for visiting the channel, and you can always um, find his material when it comes out. And... Please look out for some future things with the book Killer on a White Horse and Down the Dark Lane, the follow-up book. That's all for me now. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always BlackBoxNid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there. Until next time.